one family, on one mission, through one cooperative effort. You are now listening to the Essie Baptist Podcast. And now, here's your host, Dr. Tony Wolf. Welcome to the second of nine episodes on the South Carolina Baptist 10 by 10 plan, where we're digging a little deeper into the plan and its priorities. And you can find details at scbaptist.org forward slash 10x10. And today we're focusing on the strategic priority of African-American engagement. My name is Tony Wolf. I serve the churches as the executive director treasurer, and I have two guests with me today. Michael Pig is our director of African-American engagement at the South Carolina Baptist Convention. Michael has a long history in South Carolina and, and in Southern Baptist life at large that includes pastoring here in the Charleston area, I believe. Uh, and working with LifeWay Christian Resources and uh, serving in leadership roles with the National African uh, American Fellowship. And uh, Michael, I'm glad you joined us on the show. Thanks for being here today. I'm very happy and delighted to be with you. And Michael had a banana for breakfast. (laughs) All right. I also have with me Walter Belton. Walter is the lead pastor of Radiant Church in Charleston, where he is uh, seeing a fresh movement of God. I love to keep up with him on uh, social media. Walter has been a part of South Carolina Baptist life and ministry for a very long time as well. And I'm honored to call him my friend and my brother in Christ. So welcome to the show, Walter. Excited to be here. Guys, uh, I want you and the listening audience to just kind of hear my heart behind the African-American engagement priority. Uh, First of all, uh, I've I've said this so many times. I feel like I'm just repeating myself ad infinitum, which I probably am. But uh, these aren't necessarily my priorities uh, or, or they're not born only from my heart. They're not the priorities of the board or the BFNA. These are South Carolina Baptist. This is who we are. This mm-hmm. is what we want and what we're leaning into. So over the course of months, just traveling around and listening uh, to South Carolina Baptist pastors and associational leaders and entity leaders, this is uh, toward the top of their list in future engagement uh, for the gospel in our state. Uh, Acts seventeen twenty six says that God made all the ethnos from one blood, from one man. The, the far-reaching, devastating effects of sin is what uh, introduces ethnocentrism and racism and division into the world. We have only one solution, and we find that solution at the foot of the cross of Calvary, where according to Ephesians chapter 2, God has torn down the dividing wall of hostility and made the two groups one through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. The, the church of Jesus should be, I think, above all other places and institutions on the planet, the most demonstrably ethnically unifying agent in the world. And while South Carolina does own a, a complicated and at times very shameful history, Uh, on this exact issue, today's a new day. Hmm. And we are primed and ready for evangelizing and discipling and mobilizing African-American brothers and sisters like never before as a fellowship of like-minded South Carolina Baptist churches. And I couldn't be more excited about our future together. Amen. So, Michael, let's talk about uh, the mission field in our backyards. What What or or why is African-American engagement such an important priority for us as South Carolina Baptists? Why are we making this one of our top priorities? Well, talking about the Great Commission and Mission Advance, it should be a priority for this reason. We're surrounded by hopelessness. Mm -hmm. Our community has reflected it um, day in and day out. Uh, People walking around looking for answers and nobody's addressing their questions. Mm -hmm. And we, as South Carolina Baptists, have been trained, equipped, uh, armed with the gospel. Mm. We should go forth, and no matter what community, what area, uh, where we should walk and go, the door is wide open. Mm. God has given us the keys to the kingdom, Mm. and the gates of hell should not prevail against us. Amen. Amen. We have a charge. Uh, to share the gospel with every life. And every life has a 1.4 million population of people saying, am I included? Wow. And I believe now that we uh, have gathered the data and have actually talked to people on the streets, in the restaurants Mm. and in the stores, uh, we cannot say that we are obeying the authority and commandments of God and do nothing. Mm. Every life is important enough that as I have done for my own life, 
I make sure that I share the gospel with at least one person that is lost every week. Mm-hmm. And I do that with great joy. And, and I believe if, if we start discipling within our churches, we can remove lostness uh, in South Carolina where we're truly, truly, we can say that we are looking at one blood from the gospel of Jesus Christ who died for all and is offering that free salvation to every belief, everyone. Mm, I love that, man. 1.4 million out of 5.3 million South Carolinians, 26.5% of our state is African American. And uh, I see that as uh, not just a great mission field, although absolutely it is, uh, but a great entrustment. I mean, yeah. think about the beautiful diversity that God has afforded our state. I mean, if, uh, if he is, uh, you know, his image is reflected in all people from the one man, from the one blood, uh, then just, I mean, I've, I'm captivated by the beautiful diversity that God has entrusted to our mm-hmm. state and, uh, and excited about uh, reflecting that more closely and more intentionally as South Carolina Baptist. Walter, what, what encourages you about uh, South Carolina Baptist making this an official stated priority for today and tomorrow? <laughs> Uh, certainly, I, I, I'm excited about um, this initiative coming to the forefront. Um, I've been a part of Baptist life for more years than I can count now. And um, this conversation about African-American engagement is not new. Mm-hmm. It has been more of sideline talk backroom, boardroom talk, but it has not been center stage. Hmm. Um, and I, I've i seen in the life of Baptist, whenever we prioritize something, we have the ability to move the needle. That's right. And the way we prioritize as Baptists is we put our money behind what we believe. Hmm. And I give you an example. Um, in 2020, when COVID hit, uh, the technology of our convention and the technology of many of our churches across the state was not what it needed to be. And our convention put that on center stage. And in a matter of months, we put money behind it. We brought in uh, professionals. Uh, we put on training for people at the class and now today we have more of our churches online than ever before that's a great example and so whenever we prioritize something as baptist we do something about it there is some level of advancement when we do that um we've we've attempted to try to do something uh with african-american involvement over the years but it never really kind of took life it it dropped somewhere. Um, my personal opinion, I, I feel that uh, previous leadership saw the need, mm-hmm. but I think that may have been some slight fear that maybe uh, our convention wasn't ready. Mm. And so I, I, I heard something last week on a retreat I was on, and uh, Greg Surratt, who started Seacoast, He says this, he says, never say no for somebody else. That's good. Let them say no. So in our mind, we're thinking that we can't do this because we don't, we don't believe they're ready. You don't know if they're ready until you at least ask them. Mm -hmm. And because I've been around South Carolina, um, both black, white, Hispanics, our state is ready. Mm -hmm. Our state is ready uh, because our people they live, play, and laugh in diversity. Right. Only to come to our convention, and only 1% of our convention is African American. Mm. So I say, I believe our convention is ready. And I'm just excited, Dr. Wolf, as I've told you personally, uh, for your boldness, your clarity, mm. and just your commitment to the gospel and to the Spirit of God moving on you. So I'm excited. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Walter. Yeah. Uh, what? Let's think through. What are we talking about exactly when we say African-American engagement? Uh, are we talking about 
um, churches that may be predominantly Anglo or predominantly Hispanic or whatever, um, reaching out to their African American uh, uh, neighborhoods as well and being more inclusive in that cultural expression as a multicultural church. Are we talking about that? I think the answer is yes. And are we also talking about instinctively uh, and intentionally raising up black Baptist pastors who can pastor a distinct uh, expression of a black Baptist church that's in keeping with our core values and our doctrine and faith and practice and our missiological direction? Are we talking about that also? I think yes. yes. I think it's a yes, 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 yes. Uh, and mm-hmm. one thing I'm really excited about that I was uh, telling you brothers about earlier is is just the becoming us mindset. I mean, this is, Walter, you just articulated this so well. Uh, outside the church, uh, every day of our lives, this is who we South Carolinians are. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, I mean, we're, we live, work, and play in multicultural diversity. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe the church hasn't caught up to that. Um, right. And so uh, I think I think the intention is to just – it's really not even to become something uh, abnormal. It's just to become us, just who we are, so that we're one people. Right. I'm looking forward to that. Amen. You know, it's interesting that um, when you say we're playing catch-up, we mm-hmm. really are. Yeah. Uh, our South Carolina State House is – just over 25% African American. Wow. I mean, can you imagine? 25%. But the church, South Carolina Baptist, 1%. Um, we're supposed to be leading the way. Um, take my own life uh, as an example, probably a poor example if you ask my wife. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm a product of, of Southern Baptists investing in my life. Right. Um, the scholarship that I received to go to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary came from the Home Mission Board. Mm. Uh, you know, four year, three years of schooling. Mm. You know, where I didn't. Wait, isn't that a two year degree? Well, I, I <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I did do Greek and Hebrew. There so. you go. That's right. I crammed my four year degree into five, so I get it. <laughs> the. Uh, uh, when I think about that and think about others, uh, uh, like uh, Ken Weathersby, uh, Mark Croston, uh, mm-hmm. Ken uh, Ellis, uh, Darion Graves, uh, I mean, I can go on and on, mm-hmm. of guys that got invested in early when they were young ministers uh, to go to a school that they didn't even think of. Uh, you know, it wasn't even on the flip mm-hmm. to go to the school. And we did. And we learn discipleship, evangelism, uh, being equipped to to lead a church, to to help uh, understand that evangelism is not about indigenous only, but mm-hmm. all people. I literally learned that kind of thing, and so that investment poured all of us. It was actually a total of eighteen young ministers. All of us are still Southern Baptists. All of mm. us are still engaged. Uh, all of us are are equipping others to follow along behind us. Right. And and I believe in that mandate. I believe in that authority. And I'm so grateful uh, that our executive leadership are putting some things behind that to do likewise. Yeah. Um, talking to young ministers down in Anderson, mm-hmm. I'm saying, hey, you know, th- there is a better way. Mm. Uh, Instead of sitting around in a church service in the pulpit, sitting there waiting for your turn, that's a more excellent way. And that yeah. is, let, let's go. Yeah. Let, let's see what God has in store for you if you're willing to say, I'll go mm. if you want me to go. Let's talk about what this what this means. I'm glad you bridged that. So what, what does this mean for young black Baptist pastors uh, in the state of South Carolina? So our, our focus, our intentional engagement, African-American engagement. And let's just be honest and clear here. All of us are over 35 on this uh, podcast. Okay, over 40. I don't even remember 35. All right, yeah. Or 40. So we, <laughs> I was being as generous as Young I at could. heart. Young at heart. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the next generation of Black Baptist pastors and where they are and what something like this means for them. Uh, help, help us process that. Uh, 
how, how they might receive the intentionality behind this African-American engagement priority. And I, I know Walter has a whole lot to pour into this because he's doing it right <laughs> mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would say relevance. Relevance is, is, wow. is a huge thing. Uh, the guys that are being raised up now have to address, you know, church hurt, uh, disparity of belief, of the credibility of, of who is preaching in the pulpits, mm-hmm. uh, have to uh, ad- answer questions like, why should I be a part of your church? Yeah. I mean, I can remember a day when that was taboo to ask a question like mm-hmm. that. But now it seems like that's priority number one. And so the relevance of being raised and, and equipped for a time is this. Uh, I believe when they hear and see things like the 10 by 10 plan, they say, okay, yes, this is relevant because here's somebody saying the same things that I've been thinking. Mm-hmm. Now they're actually putting fruit uh, to the whole, whole game plan. I'm ready. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the I use that term because that's what the guy said to me yesterday. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. ready. <laughs> uh, so a young pastor, ready. He, he doesn't know what tomorrow's going to be like. He said, I'm, I'm saying to him, though, if you trust God, have faith, the relevance of your life will come to fruition right before your eyes. That's good. Yeah, so I think as uh, Baptists across the state, regardless if we are white, black, or Hispanic, we have to discover not so much what is different about us, but what do we agree on? That's good. What can we, we join each other in doing? I think sometimes we, we spend so much energy as, uh, believers trying to prove what we're against that we miss the blessing of seeing, uh, exactly what all of us are for. Mm. Um, what I've seen in, in young African American pastors is that they're not married to uh, a convention or a denomination like pastors 20 years ago. Um, and I believe that if there was something that will help to advance what they believe God was calling them to do, that they would come to be a part of that. Um, I think the convention south carolina baptist convention has a lot of resources uh skilled men and women um trained men and women we we have processes and procedures and uh we're good at a lot of stuff that Mm. we do right Mm. um we have to consider that many african-american pastors are are still working and still trying to lead Mm -hmm. a a congregation. So many of the uh, advantages that I've had because I've been uh, pastoring full time for over 20 years, a lot of guys that look like me have not been able to take advantage of the different conferences and retreats and and all of the things I've been able to be a part of, um, going on mission trips, the beautiful opportunity Michael Pig and the convention gave us to go to Africa. Yeah, that was amazing. Um, and those type things change your your worldview. Yeah, they do. Um, but I think um, our convention also need to understand, yes, we got a lot that we can give to African-American young black pastors, but we also have a lot we can receive yes. from them. That's right. Um, and I think they're there needs to be something even greater than the partnership. Um, I I never forget uh, Pastor Philip Pinckney. He he said that um, sometimes we think God wants us to go from sinner to saint. And once we get to be a saint, then that's it. But there's a next step. We go from saint to sibling. Hmm. That even though we don't look alike, we're still part of the same family. And if I have a family member out there that I have something that can help advance what God is calling in their life, then I believe it is my calling, it is my responsibility to do that. I mean, that's the picture of what uh, the first century church was, Mm -hmm. that we're going to make sure that the big takes care of the small, the strong take care of the weak. And I think when we do that, we'll see uh, more African-American pastors rise up 
and to be able to have a better worldview, to be able to understand just how ministry can be and how ministry can look. That's really good. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about some challenges, potential challenges moving forward. And I'll start. Um, I realize that me specifically, but also any person in leadership, everything you say is said to the exclusion of something else. Or you choose what to say, which means you're also choosing what not to say. <laughs> and uh, so I think some of the challenges, uh, this may not even be the biggest challenge, but it is a challenge to say out loud explicitly uh, that we are making African-American engagement a priority, but also to be able to emphasize in the right way, that doesn't mean we're ignoring Anglos. And it doesn't mean we're ignoring the 6.7% of our state that's Hispanic or the 1.7% that's uh, other foreign born. So uh, some of my challenges articulating that well so that we understand, um, you know, this isn't our sole focus, but it is an area of priority. It's, it's an area we need to engage and get better. Uh, but also to articulate that in a way that everybody knows we're not talking about discluding the, you know, the other 73 and a half percent of our population. And that's a challenge for me uh, constantly, mm-hmm. always trying to say the right thing um, without excluding, you know, a, a large group of our population. And I, I live in that tension every day. So what, and that's just me personally, uh, you know, as, as a white man, executive leader. So what, uh, what, right. what challenges, real challenges do we have? When we're talking about African American engagement uh, and they can be local church challenges or us as an organization or individuals or whatever. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I experienced that, that great day at the annual meeting mm. when, when you introduced me, <laughs> man, I tell you, they, uh, countless pastors, you know, yeah. contacted me. Now they weren't African American pastors. Right. <laughs> they were white pastors. Right. And obviously trying to answer the challenge that you mm. issue. Uh I have a large number of African Americans in my community. How do I communicate? Uh, how do yeah. I start the relationships? How, uh, how do I how do I bring them into my church? Mm. And and I understood those were words of carefulness saying, right. I don't want to destroy the fellowship I have, but God has called us to reach everybody around our church. I mean, I mean they, they walk down the street, walk on the sidewalks. Uh, occasionally they might attend an event out in the parking lot, but, but they're not in here yet. They're mm. not part of our, I'm not getting a chance to disciple them. So, so the, the big question is am I a kingdom minded person mm-hmm. or leader? Uh, because being kingdom minded uh, will do what Reinhard Niebuhr said is it Christ against culture or Christ above culture? Mm. Christ engaging the culture and changing the culture. Mm. And, and all those are distinctively perfect and, and valuable. Uh, but if, if culture is my king, versus Christ being my king, yeah. then I have, somebody might get to question my salvation. <laughs> yeah, right, yes, I don't think so. <laughs> and so, and, so, and that, that goes for both sides, white and black, mm-hmm. you know, because <laughs> they're the same characters on both sides. Yeah. Uh, I sat down and, and had a conversation with some leading African-American pastors, you know, and and uh, I can remember, I felt like I was on trial. Like, what are you about to do? You know, <laughs> you're going to come and steal all our people. Oh. I said, they're not your people. Oh, people. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and, and so all that is kingdom mindedness. I, I, I see it as an opportunity for partnership and where other people see it as a threat. So I wish God had magic scriptures mm. that we can say that will bring the tension down uh, between leaders who feel they could lose something. Mm. I want them to understand they have everything to gain. Amen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amen. Th- this cooperative partnership of, of going after the loss together, I see great things with that. Let's go. I mean, man, mm-hmm. uh, can you imagine uh, people coming to hear the gospel, getting saved? And whoever that person is proclaiming the gospel, sharing that gospel, where do you live? There's a church near you. And so that's kingdom minded thinking. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like cooperation. That's a, <laughs> <laughs> I, that's think, I think uh, some challenges that we're going to have to face and address 
of course, is the history mm -hmm. of uh, Southern Baptist. Uh, and because of the history, we're going to have to uh, address uh, trust with the African-American community um, that we can have access uh, to those 26 percent of our, our state population. And I think one of the ways to address that is that we got to take full advantage of the relational capital of the African-American pastors that are already connected uh, to our convention and use that at Capitol to, to say, hey, he's okay. Mm. What they're doing, they're doing because they love you. They want to see our, our community change. And sometimes you just need somebody to kind of, I'll say it the way I want it, say give you a ghetto pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little street cred. A little street yeah. cred to come in um, to, to do that because um, – African Americans, um, if I am to be fully honest, have been taken advantage of by many different groups mm. and sectors that will come in, um, use their numbers for grant money, right. but a lot of the grant money never reached uh, the individuals in their community. And so um, I, mm. uh, Pastor, Pastor Michael, one of the elders at the church, he He's also he also serves at, at a restaurant and he said he realized that when African Americans come in that they're looking to be slighted. Oh. So he he's intentional about not walking past them without speaking, acknowledging them, because they're looking, uh, many of them, to be slighted. And they're always kind of on edge. So we we have to be aware of that even as we um continue to pursue this avenue and just take full advantage of the the African Americans that we have connected to our convention to be able to speak to and to say, hey, what we're doing uh, is is kingdom minded. We're, we're not coming here to take over. We're coming here uh, to join God with what God is already doing. Mm. Yeah. And just to become us. Us. I, I love that. Uh, so there is there's difficulty, there's tension, there's obstacles on every side of this equation. Uh, and the only way uh, to work through it is to work through it together. Yeah, I think with, with our leaders, I, I think it would not hurt if we actually just got in the room and put the tension on the table yeah. and let us, let us just talk about Cause sometimes we, we allow tension to grow when it don't have to grow. Mm -hmm. Sometimes tension grows because we are afraid to just have the hard conversation. Yeah. And sometimes the hard conversation will ease tension and people get a better understanding and be able to walk away and say, oh, okay. Yeah. I see that. I, I agree yeah, with that. Just to understand why it feels tense sometimes is a win. Yeah. Uh, and that's really healthy. So you guys, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. <laughs> uh, thank you just for being my friends and my brothers uh, mm -hmm. in Christ. And, um, uh, Man, I'm I am. I'm not just saying this. I'm excited about the days ahead uh, when when we really start becoming us together. Amen. amen. Uh, so I'm looking forward to God doing that work in us amen. in South Carolina Baptist. Pastor Walter, would you mind uh, just praying, praying us out here and just pray that God will consider these sacrifices worthy and show us favor in, our, in our efforts. Let's pray. Father, we are. We're grateful to be able to. Uh, to be in a relationship with you. That even while we were yet sinners, uh, you sent your son to die for us. God, that amount of love that you showed to us had an impact that not only changed our life here on earth, but changed our life for eternity. And God, we are just grateful for our convention we're grateful for our leadership, um, for uh, Dr. Wolf and the vision, God, that you've given unto him. And God, we know that vision is nothing unless, God, you have given that vision and empowered that vision. Mm -hmm. And so, Father, we just pray for clarity. We pray, God, that what we do in these days and months and years to come, 
first off, God, that it is what you desire. For God, we know if it is what you desire, it is already blessed. Mm -hmm. The provision is already there. And so, God, we pray that you would begin to change the hearts and the minds of individuals who don't have a clear understanding about this vision. God, make it clear for them. Mm -hmm. For God, we don't want to run anyone off. We want to pull as many as we can close. Yeah. For God, that this work is greater than what one man can do, what one church can do, even with what one convention can do. Right. But God, with you, all things are possible. And so, Father, we just pray that you would now just breathe upon this mm -hmm. effort. Um, God, that in the years to come, we will be able to look back and to be able to believe, God, that you were pleased with our effort. Yeah. And so, God, we just thank you now even for uh, the partnerships and the friendships and the connections, God, that you are going to make. Uh, and so we just give you glory for it yes. now. So, Father, bless us, keep us, strengthen us, and God and direct us. It was in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the SE Baptist Podcast. This SE Baptist resource is made possible through the cooperative program giving of South Carolina Baptist Churches.